All right, welcome to another episode of Life Unscripted with Danny Marie. Today we have yet another special guest joining us, Michael Brennan, a creative consultant and communicator who is a passionate advocate for reigniting the loss of art, fun, and creativity. Thank you, Mike, for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate being here today. Absolutely. First and foremost, you did the art pieces behind you. Incredible work. Cool. Tell us. What I like to first ask is, tell us in your own words, everything about you and what you do. Yeah, so really uh, some of the language I've been using as of late has been that I am an evangelist of creativity and fun. And really what that means is any opportunity I get to spread the message of the power of creativity and fun, I do so. And so I communicate in a variety of formats, not just visual art like you see behind me, but I also do so in, in written word by books and things, and then also audio with podcasts and speaking at events and so on and so forth. Um, all this stuff basically came out of my own journey and I'm always sharing from life experiences, knowing that whatever it is that I'm living, whatever it is I'm going through, I know that there's something redeemable there, not just for me, but for other people. And so while the context uh, for my story is a lot, of visual art and and that background. Um, I really have identified how this can be transferable to anybody who's creating anything and anybody, honestly, who is really interested in having more fun and a a better experience in life. Wonderful. And then going back to kind of childhood, I like to go back there as the follow-up question, just to kind of paint the picture and give some more context. Tell us maybe one of the most defining moments that kind of shaped childhood for you. Sure. Yeah. So much like uh, many artists, I was the kid who was drawing and painting all the time. And my parents would, you know, hang the stuff up on the fridge and all that kind of thing. Right. And I remember at one point looking back at my experiences as a kid doing that where you know, I would create greeting cards and I would hand it to family members and I would see their faces light up and they'd be like, you made this for me. And I was like, yeah, you know, I love doing this and I love you. And therefore it's a natural thing for me to do. And I realized looking back, that was a moment where there was an exchange that happened that was really important to me. And creating for me is always rooted in connection for other people and serving other people, um, knowing that I can create something and give it to somebody else and their world can be impacted, even if it's just a smile. And so that really whet my appetite for, how can I do more of this? How can I create more things? And that took the form early on in as far as visual art and even in school, you know, college, um, going into graphic design, And so I pursued that, but still at the core of things was this importance of connecting with people, um, serving people through my creative abilities. And, um, you know, I think that that is something that, you know, when you're a kid, you're not really thinking about anything other than I'm having fun. I'm just kind of doing what feels right. Uh, And as long as I'm not getting in trouble, (laughs) right, I guess we're good. Um, But there are a lot of formative things that happen in our, in our childhood that can, really help us when we look back at that move with more intention and purpose even later on in life and i know a lot of people myself included try to go back and recapture some of the magic that has happened there and go like that was probably one of the purest forms of showing up because there weren't roles of you know responsibility and all practicality and all those things that so often you know knock us off track or take us in different directions that we never intended to go I love that you pointed out that when you were young, you, your creativity started to blossom and flourish. And it also um, became, I guess, more impactful because at that time, you saw your family members light up when you would give them their art, the art pieces and projects that you would curate for them. So just recently, I actually put up a post like, how many of these pictures and art pieces are you supposed to keep from your kids? (laughs) And so there were so many different types of opinions about that. So some people would say, you know, you take a picture and then you toss it, right? You keep the digital copy and then you toss the paper copy. Some people would say, I asked 
my child to pick out their most favorite of the pieces. And then the other ones we throw away. Sometimes we leave the pieces on the refrigerator for maybe a week. And then after that, we take it down. So, so many different opinions about the art, but what do you think was special about your family that actually kind of helped you in the shaping of, you know, your desire to be artistic and creative, that they didn't actually turn you away, that it actually continued to foster and, and um, keep you going as a, you know, a creative. So what was it about your family that kind of created the atmosphere that you can't kind of continue to move in that direction? Yeah, I think there was a, a sense of support. Um, certainly when it came time for talking about going to college, <laughs> It was it was one of those conversations, you know, that the parents kind of dread, I think, where they're like, oh, boy, my kids into art. You want to go to art school? Are you sure you don't want to be a doctor, a lawyer something that makes money? Right. <laughs> because there's so much of the prevalent um, starving artist type of mentality out there. And um, I think once they realized that I was going to be stubborn enough where I'm like, this is what I want to do. This is what I feel like I'm good at and I want to get even better at. Um, they were supportive. And, and the funny thing is, is, you know, like my dad, um, he was completely different than me. Uh, he was a New York City detective. Um, he, he, when he was growing up, he was into sports and into cars and things like that. And I'm like, I'm the sensitive artistic child, right? Like, you know, what what are we supposed to do with that? But yet, there was always a sense of even if I don't understand your world or what it is that 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 looks like, I still love you and want to support you. And so I think that's the message that came through and they would support me in whatever ways that they could um, to make sure that I, I just flourished and thrived in that. And so I was really appreciative that they kind of had that attitude and that approach to things. Um, and, you know, that that speaks, um, we believe in you, that speaks, um, continue in this, and you have a support system, which I think is huge. So going back to college, what were some of the things that you sought after that had to be included in a program that made you decide you would go into graphic design? Yeah, well, you know, it was one of those things where I was very interested in in music and entertainment. And I thought to myself, well, you know, if, if this isn't going to be drawing necessarily, it's going to be design. I want to do things that are still attached to my world that I still have interest in. And so uh, I ended up going to two different art schools in New York City, Fashion Institute of Technology and the School of Visual Arts, both that had um, professors who were working in the field, which was really important because they're giving you information and they're leading you from a place of timeliness not something that was true for the field maybe 20 years ago. And on top of that, they also have connections and a network that, you know, you can tap into. And so all that along with even being with other students who, quite honestly, a lot of times it was intimidating because the talent level was so huge and you had to really learn how to navigate past the comparison traps and figure out like, I have something to contribute here myself and I need to figure out what it looks like for me and not get lost in the sea of other students and the immense talent. Going back to the point that you made about timeliness, how do you feel art has aged and or evolved since you were in graphic design school and where it is now? What is the climate? now comparison to when you were going to school do you feel like it is in a better state or do you feel like it's been stagnant because not everyone like I feel like art in some ways yeah. is a dying Lovely. is a dying industry but also people are finding ways to keep it alive and so I'm curious what your insights are yeah I think um I think it kind of depends. It depends on where you are. It depends on what circles we're talking. Um, if it's from an educational place, generally speaking, I think there's always this battle of you have to fight for the arts. You have to prove that it's worth keeping those programs and funding those programs um, and that it's not simply just about memorization, facts, figures, science, the, the other things. Um, and so I think you know, that's always going to be part of the conversation is this almost sense of you need to prove that the arts and creativity um, have real world um, 
you know, benefits and that it's beyond things that are just child's play or, you know, nice to have kind of things. Um, in terms of like how art has maybe morphed and, and evolved, I think, you know, certainly there are skill sets that have um, become different because of technology, right? Like, so for instance, a lot of the things that I do, I'm drawing digitally. I'm drawing on an iPad with programs that give me the ability to replicate kind of, if you will, analog type things of, of watercolor and, and different materials all in one thing without actually having to, to clean up anything and, you know, without actually having to have paper, right? And so I think at the core of it, even if materials change, even if technology um, comes in and, and makes things evolve to a certain way, um, there's always a sense of the person themselves need to have a vision for something and they need to to have creative thoughts that are guiding and leading um, because that's really at the core of anything that's being created is someone has this idea someone has this vision and then they're going how can i make this a reality and then you start to get into the tools and the process and all that kind of stuff all right so what about the talent pool i know we talked about the art but what about the talent what would you say about the young people of today who are finding their own paths and getting very creative when it comes to not just staying within the, I guess the painting, I guess the structure. So I think last time I talked to you, I mentioned that people are creating art out of laundry. I saw someone who was using um some type of, I don't know, cause I'm not in it at all. I'm not in the <laughs> sure. art space at all. So I guess using, um, the sunlight and the rays to kind of create art on wood. It's just very artistic and very broad. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the talent pool who are like, we want to keep this alive. We're really committed to, you can't take art from us, no matter if it's in the institutions or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, there's certainly tremendous talent that I've seen uh, from younger people coming up. Um, and you know, it's interesting because they probably have a certain set of challenges that I didn't have, which is because of the internet and because of the exposure that they have to so many different types of art and so many different artists doing a lot of things, that's a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, you're inspired and you're like, wow, look at the possibilities. I mean, that's incredible. And then on the other side is, wow, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things. Um, and so it's easy, I think, to, you know, get discouraged perhaps um, or, or f you know, struggle with trying to figure out how you fit and where you fit in that. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, it, it for me, in my day, it was like, okay, I'm looking at art history books. I'm looking at things that people are exposing to me. Maybe if I live close to museums, I'm going there. But my exposure to what this looked like what art looked like and what it could look like was really um, kind of limited depending upon my environment. Whereas now I think that has been just blown away. And so it's, you know, the kids today, I think it's like encouraging them to utilize the benefits of, hey, there's so much out there, there's so much you can expose yourself out to, but not getting lost in that. So you don't ever get to the place where you discover your own voice and your own style and what you have to say using some of the tools, techniques, and et cetera, of, of learning, you know, so that you can show up how you need to. So who did you actually look to coming, you know, coming up and growing up and then being very interested in art and the creative, who were you looking to at that time just for inspiration? Who, um, like Basquiat, I don't know, was, mm -hmm. was that someone that you took a liking to or who were you interested in? Yeah, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned him because on my my arm here I have a, uh, a tattoo. It's the only tattoo I have, and it's uh, emulating the crown that he used a lot in his work. Um, and you know, he certainly was one that, while I was in art school, um, was very influential, as well as uh, Andy Warhol, um, a lot of his work, and then kind of completely different uh, Van Gogh. Uh, a lot of the the energy and the colors and the movement that was in Van Gogh's work, as well as his own personal story and struggles, um, I related a lot to. And then you would go to other things where it was like comic books or movies, um, music, things of that nature, which would lend inspiration, um, 
but maybe not like a, hey, I want to copy this style so I can learn it, um, but more so from a either thematic or storytelling aspect, um, or simply, you know, sometimes you just see someone who's who's so talented and so gifted that you can't help but feel inspired being around them as they're doing what they're doing. And I think being open to that and being open to what that can look like, even if it's outside of whatever your go-to is, if it's visual art, you know, looking at music, looking at dance, looking at wherever creativity, you know, can be found, seeing people do excellent work in a skillful manner, you can certainly be inspired by that. You touched on something like not copying someone else's work. So how do you pay homage to someone else's art and creativity without copying, replicating, appropriating someone's art? What would you say is that kind of thin line between those two? Yeah, I think in the beginning when you're learning, especially if it's like skill set technique based, you have to copy. You have to look to somebody else to see what did they do? How did they do it? What did they use? Because you don't have a frame of reference. And so you're doing that. But I think the, the, the trouble is some people get caught there. They stay there. It's very much like the same thing in music where when I learned how to play guitar, I had to learn scales and chords and things. And then I was like, well, I want to learn those things because there's music that I listen to that I want to play. And so I would learn other people's songs. And that was another stepping stone of like, okay, we're building on the foundation of music and now we're going into here's other people's songs and I'm learning how to play those and sing along. But I didn't want to stop there. I'm like, I want to actually write my own songs. And that's the other level of, okay, now let me take these people who have inspired me uh, the people who I've been copying in some way and put them all in a bowl, almost like they're ingredients in something that I'm preparing and mix it all up and let my fingerprints be all over those so that, yeah, there's a dash of Van Gogh in color schemes or, in, you know, movement or whatever. And some of the stuff behind me. And yeah, there's a bit of like graphic representation from Warhol. And yeah, there's a bit of, you know, and so all that stuff is kind of in there because you've been influenced by it, but you're letting it pass through you in a way that represents who you are and what you bring to the table as opposed to simply just mimicking and copying somebody. And then because art is so personal, deeply personal and specific to you, what you're feeling at the time, your visions and just your artistry, right? So when it comes to sharing that with people, putting that into the atmosphere, into the ethos, how do you feel about that moment of maybe critique so when people are giving you whether it be positive or negative feedback how do you feel about putting your art into the atmosphere and how do you strike that balance because obviously when you put that out into the world you want to hear what people have to say about it but also because it is deeply personal that can be challenging to hear and receive some of the feedback so how do you strike that balance yeah i think there's a couple of parts to that and one is being confident and comfortable enough in your own abilities and your own vision to trust yourself. Because if you're always putting something out there looking for that external validation, there's going to be a sea of voices. And some of them are going to like what you do and some of them aren't. And that's okay. And so part of that is also learning how to navigate critique. Because, um, you know, when I was in art school, we put things up on the wall and these were works in progress or, or something that we did for the assignment. And we would all go around and critique each other's work. And then the professor would say things. Now, there were times when I know that there were students in that class who were really insecure and wanted to compete and be the best. And this was their opportunity, perhaps, to say some things that were not too kind. Um, and you had to evaluate where is the feedback coming from? Is it helpful? And I don't have to take everyone's feedback. Like not everyone has earned the right to speak into me and my work. And I think that only happens, you only get to that place of confidence in your abilities and in being able to navigate those situations by doing it often. Like you can't hide in your room and not show things and not put things out into the world because you're afraid that someone's going to say something you know, bad about it or someone's not gonna understand it or, or whatever it is because it will also never be able to, to flourish. It will also never be able to impact or influence people, inspire people if you don't put it out there in the public. So 
you have to be really careful, I think, and learn how to navigate that with a little bit thicker skin. And first and foremost, like know that you are happy with it. Like even if no one else did see it, even if no one else, you know, had a chance to speak into it, what do you say about your own work and what you're doing and be comfortable and confident in that. And then when you mentioned like being okay with putting your art pieces out there to, in, to the public, what kind of ways and avenues would you say that are very helpful to go about doing that? Do you stick with social media? Do you make sure you do all of the kind of underground art the, um, places? Do you go to the different festivals? What is your process? Yeah, I think it's a mixture. Um, certainly there is a strategy of, I want all roads to lead back to me in terms of, um, I'm not relying solely on social media because we've all seen changes in social media and all of a sudden the algorithm gets upset and you don't have the engagement you once had. And so if you're pouring everything into what's considered other people's platforms, you're playing a dangerous game because changes can happen quickly and they can wipe out anything that you've built up there. Whereas if you have your own website, you have your own presence and that you own, right? That's a thing that you have control over. And you're using these other things as a hub, you know, to, to come to where you, you can really be found on your own website. Um, I think that's a smarter strategy. So yes, be on Facebook. Yes, be on LinkedIn. And yes, be on Instagram and all the other ones, TikTok. But have them drive back to you and where they can find all the things about you that you control better. And then it's not just online, it's also in person. Be a part of what's happening in a community sense. Go to some of the things like you mentioned, different shows and support other artists. Don't just go so that you are there for yourself and trying to get everybody to come and support you. Um, because I think that's what really makes a difference in terms of it being a relational thing. And that's when people feel like there's a more of a sense of you just trying to sell something to somebody, you know? Speaking of fads and things changing so quickly, let's touch on the NFT. <laughs> so what do you think was, first of all, the genesis of, did you kind of get an idea of what was happening at the beginning stages? And then if you did, what do you think that whole arc and then that drop and fall was about that happened around NFT? And what is NFT? Yeah, so, um, I mean, that's a whole big thing unto itself. And I don't want to get too deeply into that. Um, but, you know, NFT, non-fungible token, I believe is what that, that stands for. Basically, it just means that it was a representation online that was... Um, you know, attached to this thing called the blockchain so that there was, if you had a piece of art that was digital somehow, and it was the original that was um, notated as, as the original, as opposed to it just being a file that you could share around wherever. Um, in terms of art that was NFT, yes, I did try to understand that. And I actually took a class um, from somebody online to, to try to educate myself. It was pretty thick to get through. Um, and honestly, my experience was this. If someone already had a thriving community and fan base, they seem to do real well because it was another thing that they could offer that community. But much like what's called print on demand shops that pop up like, um, you know, T, T public or Redbubble or society six, there are all these shops that are basically online where you utilize their technology and their platform, you upload your designs and then they can print off t-shirts and mugs and prints and all that kind of stuff. Much in the same way, if you don't have a fan base, if you don't have a following a community, you can put that stuff up there, but that doesn't necessarily mean anybody's going to find it. And also everybody else is jumping on that bandwagon. So it gets muddy and it's hard to be found. And I think that's part of the issue is that people thought this was something that was like the silver bullet. If I just put my stuff into NFTs and I make it accessible to that, people are making millions of dollars. This is crazy. I want to jump on that as much as I can. And uh, again, from my experience, it was really more a thing of if you had a community already, it was just one more thing that you could offer. Uh, those are the people who seem to do well in the beginning, at least anyway. Okay, what art era, era are you in currently? And then take us back, maybe going backwards about how 
or you could say when you started, how did it evolve? Or you can go backwards, whichever you prefer, but just take us through the journey of your artistic creation. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question because I think probably three years ago, I started to realize there's this ever evolving um, process at work. And especially as a creator, I think that that's always going to be in place because you're always looking for that next thing you want to create. And sometimes that next thing you want to create is actually yourself. It's actually how you show up. It's actually the things you want to do and put out into the world. And so the process for me, while it started with visual art and drawing and design, it morphed and changed as I went through seasons in my life and realized like, you know, honestly, at the core of things, I'm a, I'm not just a, a creator in, in visual art, I'm a communicator. And communication shows up for me in various ways. Sometimes it's visual art. Sometimes it's spoken word through my podcast or through speaking on a stage or, or what have you. Sometimes it's written word through books I've written or blog posts or social media posts. Like the, 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 the expression is almost secondary to the message of what it is I'm trying to say. And so my message is always something of here's what I'm experiencing. Here's what I've lived through. Here's what I'm processing. How do I make sense of this? And then more so, how do I redeem this so that it's actually helpful for other people? And so as far as the, the evolution of things for me, it, it really started to um, morph and change because I went from design into the field, got burned out, left the field for about 10 years, um, went into something that was completely different, that was more people-based, um, didn't do any creativity for 10 years, suffered from depression, that ended up leading me back to asking the question of, can I get back to this place of creating? Because at one time it brought me joy, like that, that stuff as a kid and wrestling with that question, figuring out, okay, this looks like me showing up every single day, even if it's only for 10 or 15 minutes, battling with the mental health, trying to climb out of that, figuring out what does my creativity even look like anymore? That led me on a personal journey of rediscovery and not only rediscovery of my art and going, oh, these are the things I'm interested in. This is the, the subject matter. These are the tools I want to use. This is what I want to say through it. I developed, you know, my voice, my style emerged because I put the work in and I was on this journey searching. And then it led me to realize there's a process at work here that isn't just for me, I don't think. I think it's for other people. And it's not only just for other visual artists, but I think it's for all creative people anybody who's creating anything really. And so that, that gave birth to daily creative habit process that I teach and talk about. And then that led into, okay, well, how do I talk about this? Well, I can talk about this through an email newsletter that I send out and keep in contact with people and help them on their creative journey and path and resources, books, talks that I do workshops. And then that led to even talking, not only just about creativity, but then also fun because I realized you know, last year, I'm like, there's a lot of places, even within creative um, services and abilities that it's not fun. You just have to do some work and, and you know, you, everybody has to do some kind of accounting or, you know, <laughs> whatever busy work and, and whatnot. And I'm like, somewhere along the way, some fun left. How do I get back into that? How do I reintroduce that? And so that evolved into me writing a book, Make Fun a Habit. And it continues to evolve and it continues to grow. And really at the core of it is taking creativity and not just saying that has to do with artistic ability, but blowing that up and saying, I believe everybody's creative. And I believe that if we're intentional about that creativity, once we, we identify it, that's when we actually start seeing some traction and start creating things that make a difference in our lives and the lives of the people around us. So when did you identify that you were going through um, a spell of depression and that it was related probably to your lack of being creative or the opportunity, the lack thereof to be creative and be in a creative space? When did you make those correlations? It was, um, it wasn't like a, a moment in time, but it was really more a little bit of a progression. And I knew that I didn't feel right. I didn't feel aligned. 
and I was high functioning in my depression, meaning I was doing a lot of things. And in my mind, depression is sitting on the couch, not able to get out of bed. It's sad. It's mopey. It's crying. It's all those things, which sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just, you're not aligned in yourself and you're not, things just got cloudy. And I remember having this visual in my mind of like a knotted up ball of twine. And I'm like, I feel like I can't even find the edge to start to unwind this thing. I need help. And it wasn't until somebody came alongside me and said, Mike, I think you're depressed that I started to entertain the idea. And it, it, it really was a shot to me because I had always prided myself on being able to be self-aware. And I felt like this was happening on a level at which I was not aware at all until it became such a huge problem. And then it was, okay, what do we do about this? Well, I needed to be able to seek help, right? Go to therapy, um, work through these things, realize that some of it had to do with me not showing up for my creativity and denying almost like an identity of who I really am. Uh, some of it had to do with mismatched roles and responsibilities and some of the work I was doing, you know, and some of it was other things that were um, kind of adjacent to that. But um, all that led to this place of, of really rock bottom. I mean, it was a moment in my life where I, I had to move and sell a house. I had to leave a community um, and then, you know, struggling with my own internal things. And then lastly, like my dad was diagnosed with cancer and passed away quickly. And I'm sitting there kind of like in a heap of ashes going like, how did I get here? And more importantly, how do I get out? Because is this it? I don't want this to be my swan song. This can't be how it ends. And so that's what made me come back to asking the question of, can I get back in touch with my creativity? Can I do this? What does it look like? And that led to the kind of Phoenix moment of rising from the ashes. And so how did that experience make you a better coach? Because now you're coaching people and tell us more about what the coaching entails. What does that look like? But how does that make you the coach that you are today? Yeah, I think any effective coach is going to be someone who has gone through things themselves. They're not just simply speaking about it because they read it in a book or because it happens to be a trend, right? And that's always how I try and live my life is like, look, I have experiences in these areas and I believe that other people do too. And and the the particulars may look different, but there's still something universal that runs underneath it all. And so it's identifying what that universal thing is and then saying, okay, let's, let's learn here. Let's figure out how to navigate through this. And if somebody's struggling with going like, I don't, I don't know how to engage with my creativity anymore, or, you know, I've put this on a shelf for so long. I don't know if I can do this. Um, maybe it's like, I have creative block and I can't seem to move through this, you know, examining like what's really happening here. And how do we set up some systems and processes that can help do some heavy lifting for people? And so um, I lead people through this process that I talked about before, my daily creative habit process, which is designed to give people access points. And so it's not this big overwhelming thing. And, you know, it's meeting people where they're at and going, look, your context may be different. And part of your work is to take what I'm talking about and contextualize it. But once you've done that, you can start to see results of showing up every single day and prioritizing for creativity, prioritizing for fun, because you're having a better experience. You're having a better life quality. And once you decide to um, prioritize for that, it's, it's the compound effect, right? We understand this in terms of money. We put it in the bank, we see it grow. We understand this in terms of going to the gym, theoretically, right? <laughs> Losing weight and getting muscle tone. Over time, small deposits add up to something larger. And that's been my experience. And that's where I lead people into um, something that can help them so they can have that as their, their experience as well. Because art is so eclectic, how do you begin to usher new clients in and figure that part out about like what it is that they do, what it is that they need from you? How, what is that process or intake process? Like? Yeah. So there's, there's certainly, um, like I said, my, my daily creative habit email newsletter is a good entry point because it's a free email that goes out once a week. And I give people prompts that are creative that, 
maybe they want to try something and just they're not really sure what they're maybe passionate about or maybe they were passionate about something but now they fell out of love with it or they just have questions they need a place to play and experiment and i'm giving them some parameters to say here try this uh this isn't like a a you know we have to do this kind of thing but it's giving you a prompt it's giving you a direction because sometimes for people a blank page is is way too intimidating and so that's that's certainly an avenue to um to get in with people. And then I offer some other things like right now I'm running a 30 day um, creative challenge. And that again is designed for people to get in, do some small acts and build on those things. And as they do those things, hopefully they're seeing the growth, they're seeing some things happen and it whet their appetite to go, I want to go deeper in this. I want to be more intentional. I want to continue on this journey of evolution. Uh, as a creator. And so um, I love having those conversations. And, and part of the intake also is just getting out to as many places as I can, talking to people, um, whether that's one-on-one -on -one situations, whether it's, it's um, you know, talks at events, uh, and even applying this not just to a personal level, but then also to a professional level where I'm meeting with businesses, I'm meeting with organizations and talking about, look, this this idea of creativity isn't just child's play. It isn't just like, hey, put a pretty picture up on the fridge. Um, that's what some of it could look like. But we're not talking just artistic. We're talking creativity, which is so much bigger. And in a business sense, everyone says they like creativity, but a lot of times they struggle with implementation because they're like, well, how does that really affect the bottom line? How does that really move the needle for us as an organization? And we don't necessarily care about somebody's hobbies outside of work. We just care about like business. And so my conversations have morphed a little bit more even to some education for businesses to say, this stuff is important. And this stuff actually does move the needle because if you have people who are employed by you, who are feeling like they're contributing, feeling like they have ideas that they're pushing towards that uh, are making your business better or innovative, they're going to show up differently. They're gonna be more engaged. You're gonna have less turnover. Like there's so many benefits to this, learning collaboration, um, you know, it goes on and on. And so it's interesting to be able to, you know, tap into those conversations as well. And then something that I know that Something that I know for certain that a lot of coaches really struggle with is finding out that sweet balance in terms of what they will charge, how they will price their packages or their services. So again, with art being so eclectic and so broad, where do you even begin to, like, what are you charging them on? What process, part of the process, are you actually billing your client? Yeah, so... I think that's always an intimidating thing, especially in the beginning. And a lot of times, again, going back to the kind of mimicking thing, we're looking at people around us and going like, what are they doing? What are they charging? You know, we need to be careful because we need to make sure that there are correct comparisons because somebody may be in a different point in their journey in their business than you are. Um, and so you don't want to let that guide too much. Um, and quite honestly, you know, this is something that I've struggled with and I'm trying to get better and better at, but um, being a creator, I get excited about the creation process and I get excited about making a service or a product or whatever it is and getting it out there before people. But I'm so excited about getting that out to people that sometimes the launch phase of something suffers or I didn't take the time to actually validate an idea or talk to people to figure out, is this something that they actually want? And so what can happen is I can create something, throw it out there and people are like, hey, cool story, bro. But uh, that doesn't really, you know, I don't know what to do with that. I, that doesn't really meet a need for me. And so I think it's learning to, I was just doing this the other day, getting on calls with people for even 15 minutes and saying, hey, can, can we just have a quick conversation? I want to listen. I want to learn. Because here are some things that I, I think are going to go into effect as far as what I'm going to, um, you know, offer as a service and what I'm going to charge and all these other, you know, ideas. But I actually want to talk to people and get their opinions and a wide variety of people, not just the people that I kind of handpick that are going to be kind of yes people for me, right? Um, and I think that's really important to do because even as I've, I've been doing this on something else I'm about to launch, um, you get ideas and you get information from people that you would not normally 
know or process as part of this. And that can affect how you price something. It can affect what the thing looks like. Um, and so I think being open, inviting somebody into something, listening and learning, and then ultimately at the end of the day, you need to make a decision. You need to, to launch something, right? Um, and know it may not be perfect in its first go and be okay with that and say, this might be version one and version two, I'll take some learnings of what happened in this process and, and then tweak. And then also, when do you know that you've kind of reached your peak with your client? When should you be ending that relationship again? Because art is just to be this fluid process. Yeah, I think it's it's on a case by case basis, right? Because everyone's at a different point in their journey. And someone may come in thinking that their need is one thing and then through a process realize, oh, it's actually something completely different. And so because of the fluid nature of that, you need to be able to, to adapt and realize also that sometimes people are in your life for a season. You know, that's true outside of coaching and business and things too. But I think you can't get so protective where, you know, a bad coach is somebody who goes, I want to keep you under my uh, influence and just, I don't want to see you outgrow me, right? Um, I think a good coach is someone who wants the best for the person and looks to pull the best out of that person and equips them with resources, equips them with, you know, all sorts of things to help them thrive. And people will do that at different paces. And sometimes it's, it's realizing like, okay, we've gone as far as we can go here. Great. Now, maybe I'm, I'm morphing into a different type of relationship with you where maybe we're a little bit more peers, or maybe there's some other connection, but I think, you know, it's not necessarily all just like, hey, if you're a client of mine, then we have a relationship. And if you're not, well, then that's it. You know, bye, see ya. Um, I think there's a there's an aspect where, you know, really caring about the person, wanting to see them to do their best. And again, it's all contextualization and um, everyone's at a different place. Tell us a little bit about your podcast and what type of conversations are you having? Is this like more interview based where you're asking different artists to come onto the platform or is this all about you another form of expression for you yeah it's a blend of both honestly uh, i'd say most of it like probably 75 80 percent uh are conversations with other creators and i started this not just like going i want to speak to visual artists only uh, certainly there's a good number of those just because of the circles i travel in but there are also people who are entrepreneurs creative entrepreneurs who are doing something building something creating something that i think every creator needs to learn from um, because i think if you are a visual artist if you're a musician if you're any of those kind of in the arts you need to be an entrepreneur in your mindset and approach too because um, you're essentially needing to learn how to market yourself, how to show up, not just simply be the person who creates something and goes, here it is, but you need to learn how to build a business around that if you're going to do this for a business and not just have it be a hobby. And so having some of those conversations, following people's journeys to go like, how did you get to where you are today? Like, what's your backstory? Um, being curious about that and then exposing like, what's their process in things? Um, and, and I just really follow my curiosity in the conversations to see where it goes, um, because I love talking to people and learning from people and realizing like, I can learn something from somebody who maybe at face value, they're in a completely different industry, or they have a completely different lifestyle than me. They're coming from a different background. I think there's always something you can learn from somebody. You just need to be open. And so these conversations are just that it started out as me going, I want to have these conversations. They're one-on-one. -on -one, but why not let other people into this so they can benefit from these conversations as well? I'm glad you mentioned and touched on that, that as a coach, you're still coachable and you can still be influenced by other people. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate or unpack some of that, but I'm curious just what does that mean for you? Because some people would say, you know, as a coach, I need to always be the expert, always be the person that knows everything about the topic of discussion and so the fact that you're inviting other people to come on and you still feel like it sounds like every time you're having these conversations there's a resurgence or there's a newness in the experience and conversations that you're having with people I don't know that was loaded but also not really a question but <laughs> just if you want to touch on that please feel free sure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think ego can get in the way a lot of times for people thinking I'm the expert. Someone's hiring me to do this specific thing. Therefore, I need to position myself and posture myself in a certain way so that I maintain that um, you know position of leadership, influence, et cetera, et cetera. And I think my best experiences have been with people who ask great questions and listen and then offer advice. Um, and so I try to adopt that as much as possible, just personally and professionally. I know that I don't know all things. I know that I know some things. I know that I've been through some things that have taught me things that are valuable and I want to help other people. I have a heart to serve people. Um, I also know that I'm not going to be a great fit for everyone. And that's okay because I think there's a sense of community over competition. There's enough for everyone. I'd rather come from a place of abundance than of, of scarcity. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of, of, learning, being open. I think it's something that is a lifestyle. I think it's something that you practice often so that you keep yourself in a place of going, there's always something more. There's always a new level. There's always something else that I can apply. And it certainly keeps things moving and evolving. Things don't get boring or stagnant. You're not relying too heavily on some document that spells out this stale process, it's organic. And that speaks to me as an individual. And so it's easier for me to adopt that and go, yeah, I'm going to learn some things today. I'm going to have some conversations today that are going to be inspiring. And even if there's one thing that I take away from that, I'm going to be thinking about that. And maybe that causes me to apply it in a way that's different from the person that told me, but it's still impactful. And it's still tremendously valuable. And so being open, I think, is key. And then is there something creatively that you still have yet to do, but that you're looking forward to do maybe in the next two to three years? Yeah, you know, I I have a tendency try to try not to get too far ahead of myself. Um, because a lot of times, if I'm thinking too much about some grand project, I can fall into that trap of I'm going to make something, it's going to be awesome. And then it's like, nobody really wants that. Nobody really needs that. Now, if it's a passion project for me, that's different because the purpose of that is simply self-expression or to fulfill an, my own need. Um, but in terms of um, perhaps more evolution, if we can talk about it in those terms, I think the, the next evolutions are more stages for me to speak on so that I'm I'm more visible for people and it can help more people, right? Um, it's not simply being on stages so that, again, I'm feeding my ego, but it's it's me going, I have a story and an experience and I believe it's tremendously helpful for other people and I want to see everybody win. You know, I always say, I believe that when you create, we all win. And what I mean by that is when you decide to create something, you're stepping into your own self on purpose, making something that makes you feel alive, and then you put it out into the world, and then everybody else around you benefits as well. So why wouldn't I champion that as many times and as many places as possible? I'm afraid to ask this next question, but do you have a piece that you're particularly proud of? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'll be honest, you know, so the 365 day art making journey that I referenced coming out of my depression, it continued and it honestly continues to this day 12 years later and so you can imagine doing a piece every single day we're talking in the thousands uh not everything is a quote finished product or a, a thing that i'd hang on my wall but certainly the two pieces behind me um were things that i felt really good about i still do you know robert downey jr over here and then um jeff goldblum over here that style where it's very colorful it's bold there's loose lines it was me uh, embracing more of my mess, embracing more of the things that are important to me, of the looseness, the organicness, as instead of me trying to put myself in a box or in a category where I felt like I was supposed to fit into, because um, maybe someone told me that I was supposed to do it a certain way, it was more me going, okay, learn the rules, understand the context and, and the foundation, but then break through that and then embrace things that are more instinctual for you. And that's really what some of those pieces came out of. 
And thank you again, Mike, for being here with us on the platform. What advice would you give to someone who maybe is struggling with mindset or having a mental block? Um, maybe that they don't even know that art is not just this one dimensional thing, but maybe they can tap into some parts of their creativity, creative side. What advice could you give to that person? I would say the first thing is to be honest with yourself um, because we can heap on ourselves a whole lot of shame and guilt um, in thinking we're not doing something that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we're not showing up how we're, we're supposed to be showing up. And that can be a paralyzing place that just is cyclical and it's hard to break out of. And so I think the first thing is just acknowledging where you are, being honest and real, and then taking action. Because in, in my experience, action gives way to clarity. Um, it's not waiting for some moment of inspiration. It's not waiting for some clear moment and then I'll go and do stuff. But I find that if I'm taking action on something, it will lead to me understanding something. It'll lead to some clarity. And so one of the, the, the first thing I always talk about in daily creative habit process is start small. And so just like me coming out of my depression, I have to start small. 15 minutes a day may not have looked like much, but added up like those pieces behind me, they wouldn't be here today if it had not been for those 15 minutes earlier on. And so embracing that idea of starting small, manageable, don't guilt yourself, be honest, and, and just show up, be engaged, be interested in yourself enough to figure out how you work, what um, rewards for yourself work right, and, and what your motivations are. Um, I think the more that you can be a student of yourself, the better off you'll be because you'll you'll understand how to navigate through some of these things and what's really important to you. And then you start to discover a little bit more of purpose and a little bit more of passion and apply that to your creativity. That's when things really start to take off. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of Life Unscripted with Danny Marie. Thank you, Mike, again. Thank you. Absolutely.